may be seated. All right, today, tonight, we continue our studies in the book of Revelation, looking at the next church, the church at Smyrna. We're in Revelation, and we're in chapter 2, and tonight, the Lord willing, we'll be looking at the end of the church at Ephesus. There were two verses that we haven't covered yet related to the church of Ephesus, and then moving on to the church at Smyrna. So you recall that last time we were in Ephesus, we talked about the use of the term the angel of the church at Ephesus. We saw that's the messenger, that's the passage that deals with the pastor of that church. And we see to each of the angels, there are different pastors of each of these different churches. Some of them had better churches than others, but they are held accountable for the churches where they are ministering. And I pointed out that's a big lesson for me. We talked about Ephesus being a doctrinal church. They had very strong doctrine. They knew their doctrine. They applied their doctrine. They were hard workers. They exercised church discipline. They were what we would call reformed in their theology. They obviously believed in predestination and election. We talked about how that tied in with the epistle to the Ephesians, chapters 1, 2, and 3, very clearly. Doctrinal chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, are the practical chapters. How do you apply the doctrine of election to real life? And that's what you see in chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Ephesians. Jesus warned the church at Ephesus, however, that he would remove their church because they had left their first love, which means you can be very doctrinally strong and you can still get knocked out by the Lord Jesus Christ. They had one other real true benefit that another church had compromised on. It said they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and that's what we want to look at tonight because we hadn't covered that uh, in our last message. So we're going to cover that before we get into the church at Smyrna, but they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Interesting. Lost love, but they still retained some hate. Now, it was a good hate, but they'd lost love. They retained hate. You know, sometimes it's easier to hate than it is to love. How many of you have ever experienced that kind of thing? <laughs> Where you can remain mad at somebody for a really long time, uh, and your affection for somebody might sort of dwindle and wane because you're focused on other things. The church there at Ephesus was that way. They had lost their first love, their zeal for Christ, but they sure were good at hating Nicolaitans. And Jesus commends them for that. Later on, we find the church at Pergamos loved the Nicolaitans. <laughs> oh my, how sad. You remember we saw some parallels between the different churches, how one church can be strong in this area and weak in this area. But then the next church might be weak in the area the first church was strong in and strong in the area where the second church was weak. And we saw that as we went through the list. So there were no perfect churches, though some were clearly and obviously better than others of the seven churches. Painful situation, but it's a reminder to us that in our church there's always room for improvement. We never arrive when we're here in this life. There will always be something that tries to move in. At Ephesus, the issue was love for Christ, proved by obedience, obedience rooted in love, not merely obedience based on mechanisms or mechanical love. The loss of love, final conclusion, demands repentance or death and church dissolution. It's a serious warning. If you don't repent from losing your first love, it means death of the church and dissolution. We looked at the four overlays when we studied the book of Revelation. The direct interpretation, written to the seven literal historic churches. The historical interpretation, which gives a basic outline of church history from the apostles to the rapture. The church type interpretation. Seven li letters list seven types of churches at the time of the apostles. So that enables you to compare those churches and see things that are wrong in your churches that Jesus either likes or dislikes so that you can correct them. And then the church application interpretation with those other three 
overlays in place, that's ultimately where you want to end up with application. What does this mean for me today? It's fun to study prophecy. It really is. I love studying prophecy. But it has application to how you live now. Those are true things that are going to happen in the future. But in light of what's going to happen in the future, how are you living now to prepare for the future? There always has to be application of it. And when we combine those with the first levels, three levels, we end up with two key church activities. Number one, purification of the church. And number two, preparation for Christ's return. We went through the churches and we did that second overlay. We had already studied Ephesus, so we're doing the second overlay, which was the historical interpretation, the outline of church history. I passed out uh, little handouts last week, which I normally don't do, but I gave you all seven churches and showed you what has been historically understood to reference different periods of church history, the apostolic era, the persecution era, the official religion or temptation to compromise era, and persecution era is what we're looking at tonight, that's Smyrna and how they suffered persecution. The fourth church, Thyatira, which was the age of compromise, or, or what we would call the dark and middle ages. The fifth church, Sardis, which sort of parallels the Reformation period. The sixth church, Philadelphia, the great missionary outreach to the world. And then Laodicea, which is the church in careless decline and apostasy, which really runs us from 1900 to the present day. We compared the seven different churches. Ephesus, they were positive. They hung in there, they hated the Nicolaitans, the negative, they'd lost their first love. Smyrna, positive, they were spiritually rich, their eyes were opened, but the negative was they were about to slip. Keep hanging in there is the word to them. Pergamos, they had faithful martyrs, they had hung in there, but the negative, their eyes were not open, and they loved the Nicolaitans, whom God said to Ephesus, he hated them just like they did. Thyatira had great works, they had love, service, faith, patience, that's really positive. The negative, they had Jezebel, sex, idols, and the depths of Satan. Sardis, there are some positive things. They had a few faithful who gave a good name, but the negative was that the whole church in general was spiritually dead. Then Philadelphia, the positive things, they obeyed the word. They relied on Christ for strength. They had not denied Christ. They were loved by Christ. But the negative was they weren't growing spiritually he wanted them to take it to the next level. He tells them to hold fast so they don't lose their crowns. They were about to lose heavenly rewards, and we've dis discussed on Sunday morning what it takes to lose heavenly rewards. We've seen that rewards are tied to walking by faith. You get all these alkalades, everything seems to be fine. You begin to relax on your haunches, <laughs> and you no longer walk by faith. They're exhorted, be careful because you're about to lose some crowns. You're about to lose some heavenly rewards. Never get complacent. Never think that you're okay because you're on the verge of falling off the cliff, of losing those things that you have wrought. He says, don't let it happen that we may receive the full reward. And then Laodicea, they had only one positive thing said about them. Like Philadelphia, they were loved by Christ. Imagine that God loved them. Even the rotten church at Laodicea. The negative was they were lukewarm. Oh, they had a lot of temporal riches. They got money. The church that had money, I gave you an illustration of a church where I substitute uh, supply preached for a while. Uh, and one of the uh, deacons in that church had come up to me all puffy and haughty and said, you know, it doesn't matter Everybody in this church could die and we could still keep on going. We've got so much money in the bank. Mm. Laodicea. They had spiritual poverty. So, tonight, Smyrna. This is Smyrna part one, church number two. Revelation chapter eight, uh, two, verses eight and following. We need to pick up the last couple of things at Ephesus, which is the Nicolaitans. Now, why is this significant? The reason that that's significant is that whereas the doctrinal church, remember Ephesus, doctrinal church, Ephesus, doctrinal church. We'll say it again, Ephesus, what is it? Doctrine. Doctrinal church, okay. The church at Ephesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's really good because 
Jesus talks about the Nicolaitans twice. He talks about them to the church at Ephesus. He talks about it to the church at Pergamos. And he says, you guys are really good on this because I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans too. When we get to Pergamos, it's not an issue of doctrine. It's an issue of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's a very significant point to notice in comparing those two churches. The church at Pergamos celebrated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but the church at Ephesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Deeds versus doctrine. You know something? Those two are always tied together. What you believe will end up in what you practice. What you really believe will affect how you live. And I think it's significant that Smyrna, where there were no Nicolaitans as far as we know, Smyrna is wedged between Ephesus and Pergamos. Church 1, Ephesus. Church 2, Smyrna. Church 3, Pergamos. First, the verses out of Ephesians, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Here's what we see about Ephesus and the Nicolaitans. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation, first church, takes us back to Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Beginning in the paradise of God, ending in the paradise of God, and that's a hint of what's to come in Revelation chapter 22, where the river of water of life flows through the garden of God. Ephesus has a promise. Ephesus has a promise. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now that's said to the churches, but it's attached to Ephesus, the doctrinal church. Overcomes. What did Ephesus have to overcome? The loss of their first love. Ephesus, you got your doctrine straight. You hate the Nicolaitans. I hate the Nicolaitans too. You've lost your first love to him that overcometh. I've got something for you, the tree of life, in the midst of the paradise of God. So, Smyrna, Nicolaitans are not mentioned, which is verses 8 and following. Apparently, they had never been able to gain a foothold at Smyrna because the church at Smyrna was going through what we might call hyper-persecution. Now, we'll see that Pergamos had some persecution too, and they had some faithful martyrs at, at Pergamos, but Smyrna, according to the text, was really undergoing persecution. One of the things that church history has taught us is that false doctrine does not last under persecution. And therefore the false practices connected with false doctrine don't emerge in the church. The church is too busy trying to survive. They can't put up with the nonsense. Here's Revelation 2, 8 and following. Under the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things. These things set the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. In other words, they're going through persecution. You're going to get killed. But remember, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus can take care of you. He writes, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. What a contrast with Laodicea. <laughs> you guys got all the money you need, but you're poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. That's what he said to Laodicea. Here's a church that had no money, but Jesus said, thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, back to our message this morning. What does it say? First two words in verse 10. Fear none, none, none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Living the Christian life is not riding to heaven on a bed of roses. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease 
while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? If you live for Christ, the Apostle Paul declares it clearly, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, what's the last word? Persecution. Smyrna is a church that was experiencing that. It was a church that was living godly in Christ Jesus. They had God's blessing because of that. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. He doesn't just say, the general secular government will cast you into prison. Or bad guys who are just motivated by money will cast you into prison. And because you don't have any money, you're not going to get out. He says, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Did you know that in a place like North Korea, where to own a Bible means that you will be cast into prison and you will be tortured and you may be put to death just for carrying a Bible? It tells you here who's behind that. The devil shall cast some of you into prison. We tend to try to wishy-washy on that subject, but there is no question in my mind that Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, is demon-possessed. The devil is the one who is behind the irrational, murderous persecution of Christians in North Korea. And the same thing is true in all the other oppressive nations of the world. It's not an accident, and it's not merely doctrinal differences. The devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. Folks, we may be called on someday to that level of faithfulness. Be thou faithful unto death. How far does God want us to take it? How far does God want us to be faithful until the going gets tough? Until we're sweating a little bit? Until it looks like we're not fast enough in the race? Until it looks like somebody doesn't like us? Be thou faithful unto death. And look at the promise. And I will give thee a crown of life. Satan offers death. God offers life. When push comes to shove, regardless of the pain that's involved, which would you rather have, death or life? That's a choice you may be called on to make someday. I will give thee a crown. The crowns speak of our rewards. I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt. Ah, here we find out what life is all about. Will not be hurt of the second death. There are three kinds of death. I discussed those with a person this morning. There's, of course, physical death. We're all familiar with that. Someone dies and we see their body. Now, the fact that they're dead doesn't mean their body is non-existent. Physical death doesn't mean non-existence of a physical body. Physical body is still there, but they're dead. There is spiritual death. That is where the spirit is dead and unresponsive to the realm of the spiritually living. That's what Paul talks about when he says, and ye sometime were dead in your trespasses and sins. It doesn't mean that you were non-existent in your trespasses and sins. You had a dead, though very real, spirit. It was in rebellion against God, but it was not non-existent. But here he talks about something else. He talks about the second death. And we discover that that is defined for us in Scripture as the lake of fire. The second death 
is the lake of fire. And all those who have never trusted Christ, who are still spiritually death at the point, dead at the point of their physical death, those are the people who will be given into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Here's the great promise. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And that brings us to the contrast for tonight, which is Pergamos, third at Pergamos. The Nicolaitans had not only gained a foothold, but were a very curse to the church. Under the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now, we don't know exactly where Satan is living today. He might be living in Rome. He might be living in Jerusalem. He might be living in Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. He might have chosen some other place in the Muslim world or maybe in you know, Pyongyang. We don't know. We're not told. But Satan is a creature. That means he's localized. He can only be in one place at one time. He has an incredible network of demons, and they pass information very quickly between one and another all over the world. But he himself has to be only in one place. At the time the book of Revelation was written, Satan's seat was at Pergamos. That means there was going to be some special pressures on the church at Pergamos. But they were hanging in there tough in verse 13, They'd even had a, a major church leader by the name of Antipas who was killed. They'd refused to deny the faith. He was slain among them. And it not only says in verse 13 that Pergamos was where Satan's seat is, it says that's where Satan dwells. He lives there. I suspect that Satan lives someplace where he's doing his best to kill as many believers as he possibly can today. But then we find some things that are negative, and here we have the Nicolaitans parallel with the doctrine of Balaam. Look at verses 14 and 15. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, so thou also hast them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He parallels the doctrine of Balaam with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The practices of the doctrine of Balaam with the practices of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, God hated the Nicolaitans. Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans. Pergamos did not hate the Nicolaitans. They tolerated them. They embraced the Nicolaitans. They're fair to hate. And God uses a powerful word there. He didn't say, well, just sort of feel uncomfortable with or sort of shun the Nicolaitans. He says, I hate them. And Ephesus, you're good guys because you hate them. You hate their deeds, you hate their doctrine. The failure of Pergamos to hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans produced, according to the text, very lewd and licentious libertinism. We're going to talk about libertinism a little bit later on. But that gives you a clue concerning the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and we'll discover. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar to the Galatian heresy. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatia about the people who had perverted the doctrine of Christian liberty. And he uses some very strong words in Galatians as well. But we won't get to that tonight. The Lord willing, we'll see that next week. And then Jesus says in chapter 2, verse 16, dealing with Pergamos, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So that immediately takes you back to chapter 1, the son of man vision, because the sword of his mouth is the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of my mouth is the word of God. What God speaks, his word. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Ah, huh, we've been talking about manna in the Old Testament too, haven't we? You know, it's interesting how many of these things go back to the studies of Israel in the wilderness wanderings and some of the same problems that Israel had in the Old Testament. And we'll see that really clearly tonight, I hope. Some of the same problems they had in their rebellions in the Old Testament are suddenly reflected in the seven churches over in the book of Revelation. We'll learn more about that of the Lord willing in a few minutes. I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Back in the days when I was a Boy Scout, which was a very, very, very long time ago, <laughs> um, they had a ceremony, and I'm not really very keen on this ceremony now, in which uh, the leaders of the troop, you know, they have all these Indian ideas in there, uh, gave you a secret name. And they said, you will only have this secret Indian name uh, if you never tell anybody what it is. And I thought, boy, what a, what a parallel of the book of Revelation. We're given a new name that nobody knows but we ourselves. But here was a secret Indian name. And so they would take each boy up next to the fire and all the rest are sitting around and the leader would whisper the name into the ear of the boy. I felt very uncomfortable with that. I don't know about you, but I felt uncomfortable with that. Secret name? Indian name? <laughs> Long time ago. But God's going to give you a name which no man knows but you yourself. In other words, a special name. You know, Judy and I had some special names for each other. I mean, other people heard them like our kids heard them. But um, I would call her Motek. And you say, Motek, what in the world is that? <laughs> that was her special name. Hey, Motek. Well, that's a Hebrew word for sweetheart or sweetie pie. Hey, Motek. Yeah, I didn't call my kids Motek. I never called anybody else Motek. That was a special name I gave to her. Jesus, because he loves us, not just as a church, but individually, will give us a name that no man knows but we ourselves. Now, we have two sources of information regarding the Nicolaitans. Obviously, the first source is right here in this chapter, which mentions the Nicolaitans. The second is church history. There are several ancient commentators who connect the Nicolaitans with Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, who's mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. He was one of the first, what, seven what, nobody remembers? I preached through this in Acts chapter 6. He was one of the very first seven deacons. That's right. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. He was a Gentile who'd converted to Judaism and now had become a Christian. And he was obviously zealous. At least at that point, it seemed zealous for the Lord. And uh, the multitude said, yeah, he's really a good guy. We've seen what he's been doing in terms of all the help that he's been giving. And, you know, he, he's out there ministering to the widows and to the orphans and doing all this cool stuff. And, you know, he really seems like on fire for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, remember, it says... The apostle said to the multitude, you guys find people who can do the job, and then we'll ordain them. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So those are the guys that got set up to do all this serving of tables, all the practical, functional ministry of taking care of widows and orphans in the church. 
And when the apostles didn't have to do that any longer, it says the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Have another one of the principles of church growth here. When those who are functioning as the teachers, the Bible teachers in the church, are freed up from the mechanical aspects of the church, suddenly you have church growth where they can give themselves to the word of God and to prayer. We talked about a couple of others this morning. Okay, well, let's talk about Nicholas for a minute. So some people have objected and they've said, well, now, wait a minute. How could one of the first seven deacons who was actually ordained by the apostles at the very outset of the church, how could he have defected and started a heretical movement with such bad doctrine and bad practice that God says he hates them? Good question. Do we have any other hints anywhere in scripture that this kind of thing might have taken place? Well, I don't think it should surprise us because the Apostle Paul warned not about deacons, Paul warned about elders whom he himself had ordained at Ephesus. Huh, Ephesus, first church we've just been talking about. He warned the church at Ephesus that the certain elders would defect after he left. In fact, he prophesied that they would rip the flock to shreds. Remember, Ephesus, first church of the seven churches here in Revelation. They obviously had taken Paul very seriously, and they tried very hard to keep their doctrine and practice pure. And that's exactly what they'd done. But in the process, they lost something else. They were fervent servants of Christ. And they tried the people who said they were apostles and weren't. They put them on church trial. They dragged them up to the front and said, Okay, tell us what does it take to be an apostle? Now those of you who were with us on Sunday evening when we went through all the spiritual gifts know that those initial gifts, apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, seven temporary gifts were only given during the apostolic period. So we're still in the apostolic period at the time that you know, the Ephesian elders were testing people who claimed to be apostles. And they said, well, we're like Paul. You know, we're born out of due time. I mean, we're not one of the 11. You know, Judas killed himself. We're not one of the 11, but, but we're apostles too. And we've got visions and we've got dreams and we've got... Revel Church of Ephesus said, no, wait a minute. We're going to test that. We're going to compare it scripture with scripture and see whether or not you guys really are. And it says, you've tried them that are apostles and you found that they were liars. Pretty good church. They were trying to stick firm. Paul had warned them, after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. Also from among your own selves. Remember, it was the Ephesian elders who came to, let me read you the passage, came to Miletus, because Paul didn't want to stop at Ephesus. He was heading out to Rome. Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they, that is the elders, were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Now, church at Smyrna we just read about, they had people, Jews, who were giving them grief. Interesting. Just like they'd done with Paul. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So big groups, little groups, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing what things shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Yeah, I know, I'm going to be in trouble again. That's typical. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. The Apostle Paul set the example for the churches to hang in there unto death. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He says, I don't count my life dear unto myself. You see, so much of what Paul taught reflected 
in the churches, though none of them quite got the whole picture in Revelation. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God, I'm not going to let anything sidetrack me from the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, now he's talking to the elders, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock. You can't take care of the flock if you don't have your own act together. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, nearest antecedent is God, hath purchased with his own blood. Paul saying Jesus is God. The church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. A very clear declaration of the deity of Christ because it's tied to his substitutionary atonement. For I know this, that after my departing, we have two kinds of wolves here, outside wolves, inside wolves. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Paul was leaving. He'd never see them again. Suppose that tonight you were saying goodbye for the last time the people or person you loved most in all the world. And you know you'll never see them again this side of heaven. You're about to set sail, perhaps in the days of Hudson Taylor, to go to China or to go to India, William Carey. And you had premonition you will not ever see the people you love again. That was Paul at Ephesus. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Ah, oh, they still had the word. God was still with them. The word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He said another example for them, which a couple of the other churches failed at. Pergamos certainly failed on this area, but we'll look at that in a moment. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Paul understood the danger of covetousness. He understood the danger of greed. He understood the danger of material things holding you back from what God designed you to be. Focusing on earth instead of focusing on heaven. Focus on temporal comfort instead of focusing on heaven. Focusing on avoiding pain instead of focusing on heaven. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul was willing to work with his hands. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Those are the words of Christ. Did you know those words are not found in the Gospels? You look all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll never find Jesus saying those words. But Paul is quoting Jesus. John tells us at the end of the Gospel of John, you know, I've told you an awful lot of stuff about Jesus. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the believing you might have life through his name. But John also tells us at the end of the Gospel of John, many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. 
God the Holy Spirit only cho chose certain things that Jesus said and certain things that Jesus did to put in the Gospels. The Gospels cover, well, at least two of them cover all the way from his birth, all the way through his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. They cover three years of ministry at the least. Now, they're silent years from the time that Jesus, you know, came to the temple and got his bar mitzvah and then disappeared from his parents. But at age 12, the silent years. But here's something Paul tells us Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most for all of all for the words which he spake that they should see his face no more and they accompanied him to the ship was were the Nicolaitans followers of Nicholas the proselyte of Antioch we don't know for sure though a number of ancient church historical refer references connect him to that but the most important issue is not who started the Nicolaitans but what did the Nicolaitans believe and practice so that we can avoid what God hates. We can get all hung up on, well, was it Nicholas, uh, the Prophet of Antioch? Uh, was he good Saint Nick uh, who became Santa Claus? And yeah, you can get into all kinds of crazy things like that. And then we therefore hate Santa Claus at Christmas time because of the Nicolaitans. That, that's wrong way of thinking. Santa Claus is simply a God substitute. He's omniscient. He knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. That's an attribute of God. Okay. There's nobody like Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, in the old way, uh, who knows everything about you, whether you're awake or asleep and all that kind of stuff. Only God knows that. He's a God substitute. He's a Jesus substitute. He gives gifts, so does God. But his gifts are temporal. His gifts are the ones that everybody likes to get at Christmas time because it's fun and it's shiny and it's new and I can play with it. Instead of realizing the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Take your eyes off Jesus and put them on Santa Claus. We don't need to go there. Because we know what the Nicolaitans believed. The text tells us what the Nicolaitans believed. And it tells us the practical results of that false doctrine. So... What do they believe in practice? Let's look at the statements in Revelation. We can develop a, an abbreviated list of their doctrines and practices. Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat the same sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He parallels the doctrine of Balaam, with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's set in exact parallel here. So, let's look at some of the passages dealing with Balaam, and we can see that the first error of Balaam was covetousness. That, by the way, is very, very similar to the prosperity gospel preached by many of the charismatics, the name it, claim it, you know, uh, kind of gospel that they preach. Balaam was willing to twist his relationship with God to get money from Balak the king of Moab. That's in Numbers chapter 22, verses 5 through 41. In fact, we have three chapters basically on Balaam. The Bible says a lot about Balaam. And so when the New Testament ties things to Balaam, you better know something about Balaam. In fact, not only does the book of Revelation tie Balaam to false doctrine and false practice, so does 2 Peter and so does Jude. So when you begin to put this picture together, you can discover why God hated both the deeds and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Let me read you some of Numbers chapter 22. I can't believe how fast our time is going. <clears throat> the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. I guess they should be. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian. Now, Midian and Moab were joined together at this point. They were, you know, allies. 
Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with rewards of divination in their hand. They had money, and they said, look, you do us a favor. You manipulate the divine powers. We'll give you money if you will do it. That's what divination is, is trying to perceive the future and manipulate the spirits that can control different things in the future. And they came to Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you again as the Lord. That's all capitals. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. Shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Now just stop and think about it for a moment. Balaam knew who the true God was. Balaam knew that that God was sovereign. Balaam knew that that God, Yahweh, Jehovah, was able to curse and to bless, and it would come to pass. Balaam actually had contact with the true God. But Balaam, Balaam had a weakness. Balaam loved money. Oh, he loved money. We'll discover that in the text. And God came unto Balaam and said, it doesn't say a demon came to Balaam. It doesn't say that some spirit came to Balaam. It says, and God came unto Balaam and said, what men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent me, sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. For adventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, This is pretty blunt. Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Bottom line, over and out. Pretty short message. Balaam sort of shrugs his shoulders. From the back of his mind, he's thinking, there's got to be some way to solve this problem. Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, get you up into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. So the princes of Moab rose up. They went unto Balak. They said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. Balak is not going to give up. Balak, Balak's entire nation is at risk. Now, he's a good national leader. He wants to protect his nation. Of course, he's going about it the wrong way, but he wants to protect his nation. So he says, well, maybe, maybe we, we sent guys who were a little bit too Mickey Mouse for him because he's a big name. So Balak sent again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and they said, Thus hath Balak the son of Zippor, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Nothing? How about God? For I will promote thee to very great honor. So in other words, we're not only offering you, uh, you know, money to pay for your divination, you know, standard fair price, but we're going to honor you too. We're going to really make you big. We will promote you unto great honor. I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Whatever you want. Hey, it's yours. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, they can see where he's thinking, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. The bug has been planted. I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God. Jehovah, my God. Balak, Balaam claims to be a follower of and a servant of the true God whose name is declared in the text to do less or more. <laughs> but 
he still thinks maybe there's some kind of a way. So he says, well, now therefore I pray you, tarry you here also this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. How many times when we know the will of God, do we say, well, there's got to be another way of doing this? Yeah, I, I got to get around this somehow. I, I'm going to ask God to, to give me a, another way around it. And so we press, and we press, and we press because we want something for us. God says, okay, let me play along with this game and teach you a lesson. So God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Okay, you want to go? You want a vacation? You want to take a trip? Okay, you can go with them. But you're going to, tell, you're going to say what I tell you to say. And Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, wait a minute, you say, but God just let him go. Does God ever change? No. In other words, Balaam should have said, Lord, I know you really don't want me to go with him. I'll take your first word. I really don't need a second opinion. God was mad because he went, even though God said, okay, go. See what happens. <laughs> well, what happened was God got angry. God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? Jesus. Stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Stupid donkey, you're making a fool out of me. You're making a fool out of me. Get back on the road. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyard, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. In other words, okay, you want to run out into the field? Let's get you someplace else. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself under the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. He's beating her. You stupid donkey, you smashed my foot. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. <laughs> now, whose anger did we start with in this passage? The anger of the Lord was kindled against Balaam. Now Balaam's getting mad at a donkey. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. The Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam is so mad, he doesn't even fall off the donkey and say, What in the world? The donkey is talking to me? Balaam said unto the ass, He actually carries on a conversation with his donkey. Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. How determined was Balaam to go to Balak and see if he couldn't get some money? Pretty serious issue with him. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? And was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and that's Jehovah, Yahweh, opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, standing in the way. The angel of Yahweh is Jesus. And his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face, as well he might have. Jesus, the captain of the Lord's host. Jesus, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. He's not an angelic being in terms of a created being. He's the messenger of the Lord. He tells people what God wants done. 
The angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. That's what God says about Balaam. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And you just threatened her life. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. And I was, whoa, baby, I'm in trouble. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that shalt thou speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him into a city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is the utmost coast. He was so happy. He said, man, I, I'm going to catch him as soon as he crosses the border. I, I don't want him to turn back after he's almost to me. And Balak said unto Balaam, I did, earn, did not I earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able to promote thee to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, and Balaam having just gone through that experience, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything that the word God putteth in my mouth? That shall I speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came unto Kiriat Huzot. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal. Hmm. We're going to see there was a church where there was a woman named Jezebel. Her name comes from Baal. We'll see more about Baal as we get a little farther. And thence he might see the uttermost part of the people. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, prepare me here seven oxen, seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and, Balak, and Balak, Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offerings, and I will go, peradventure the Lord will come to meet me. And whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place, and God met Balaam, and said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. See, he's trying to function with mechanical religion. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. And he returned unto him. And lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifices, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. Oh, he didn't know what he was giving up. That prophecy. Do you know how Balaam died? If you don't, I'll tell you in a minute. But in that prophecy, he says, let me die the death of the righteous. Let my end be like the end that God has promised for Israel. And Balak said unto Balaam, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies. Behold, you have blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, come, I pray thee, uh, come with me to another place from whence I may see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them all, and curse me them from hence. In other words, let's see if we can knock them off a piece at a time. And he brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by the burnt offerings while I go meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam. It's Jehovah met Balaam. And put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and say thus. And when he came to him, Behold, he stood by his burnt offerings, and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? <laughs> God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man who changes his mind. Listen to what God said. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth. And he took up his parable, and he said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. 
God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed. I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Now you think about how wicked Israel was, how wicked Jacob is. We've been talking about the sins that Israel had as they were crossing the Red Sea and as they're going into the wilderness. But God had put them under a shield where he didn't see that. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of the king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to his time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey, and drink of the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. No, stop talking. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh that I must do. Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I'll bring thee to another place. Poor adventure will please God that thou mayest curse me for them from thence. Did you know God's not impressed by locations? <laughs> if God tells you to do something and it's right in one location, did you know it's right in every location where you go? Jesus says, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Can you think any place that doesn't fit into the uttermost parts of the earth? It doesn't matter where you go, you can still get the same word from God that you're supposed to proclaim. You cannot adapt it to the culture. You know, there are some modern so-called translations which are being promoted in Muslim countries because the term Son of God is offensive to Muslims. It's a movement called Chrislam, Christianity and Islam. And so they talk all about Jesus as a great prophet and all that because the Quran talks about Jesus as a great prophet. And the Muslims accept that. But they never translate any of the passages that deal with the deity of Christ or the phrase Son of God that way. They'll translate it as Servant of God or something else, but not Son of God. Did you know that if you don't, if you don't proclaim the Christ of Scripture, you do not lead people to genuine salvation because they've trusted in a false Christ. You and I have the same message to carry no matter where we are, any place in the world. Our time is up. Um, let me just finish this passage about Balaam. <laughs> no, we're not going to finish this passage about Balaam. <laughs> we got too much to go. I hope you're getting sort of an insight into what was wrong with the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans because it's paralleled with Balaam. And that's not the only thing about Balaam, not just covetousness. There are some other very serious things as well. We'll have to pick that up next week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Your word is true and righteous altogether. Your word does not change. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Forever. Your word is forever settled in heaven. It's the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And indeed, Balaam's thoughts and intents were being clearly revealed as were later the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it has been preached tonight to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen.